Thank you everyone for attending today. Uh, I'm really excited to tell you a little bit more about what we're doing here over at Carne Collective. I started Carne Collective with my best friend and partner from Argentina, Fernando Cantini, to bring the highest quality beef from Argentina here to the US after seeing how much better the meat was from when I was visiting. I couldn't really put my finger on exactly what was better, but after doing a little bit more research and finding out why the meat in Argentina was different from what I was used to over here in the US, I, I was really you know, kind of taken back. I had been eating meat my entire life, really not knowing uh, what exactly I was putting into my body and what you know, our, our industry here was doing to our cattle. Um, one of the main reasons that Argentinian beef is so different than the beef here that we have here in the US is that it is, is roughly unchanged for the last two, 300 years. Their farming techniques are not much different. They still run, <clears throat> ride gau uh, the gauchos still ride their horses uh, along the vast plains of, of La Pampa, which when I went to visit were, were unbelievable. There was hundreds of, uh, of a, thousands of acres of just free pasture for the cattle to graze on. So what I learned that why Argentinian beef was so much better was that it was, it was really just natural letting the cows do what they do. They are really interfered minimally uh, by the gauchos. They are free to roam on pasture their entire lives to eat grass, to drink water out of the wells. It is really the most natural way uh, to raise beef. Uh, and our cattle are not only grass fed, but they are never fed hormones or antibiotics uh, and are never feedlotted. So, which reduces the chance of any uh, food or of any illnesses that are you know, why we give uh, antibiotics and hormones to the cattle here in the U.S. Uh, being grass-fed makes the meat really taste different. It's much leaner. You have a little bit of a beefier taste, uh, and it's really, really tender and juicy. Uh, that's why we always recommend to cook our meat medium rare. It really lets the flavor of the beef come in. And, and Argentinians themselves, they don't really flavor steak too much. Just a little bit of salt and uh, cooked really nice and slow over embers. We're really excited to be bringing Argentinian, to be the first to be bringing Argentinian beef on a national level direct to consumer here in the US. The majority of our team is based in Argentina uh, as we try to keep ourselves as authentic as possible. And my partner, Fernando Cantini is in Buenos Aires uh, and is in charge of all of our operations, inspecting our farms and the cattle every week. We started Carne Collective uh, with an ESO, ethos of sustainability and leaving the earth at a better place uh, than we found it. I, I think this really is, is important now. Uh, as I'm sure many of you have read or heard uh, the Epicurious article and how they will not be uh, featuring meat in a lot of their dishes and recipes because of the sustainability factor. One of the, and that totally makes sense here in the US with our farming practices, but in Argentina, the way that we raise our cattle is actually giving a net positive to the environment. We, because not only are our cattle grass fed, but we rotationally graze them, which is better for the soil. Um, and it really sequesters carbon from the atmosphere into the soil. And we never feed lye and, and we never feed them grain. Um, so it really is uh, much better for the environment than our traditional uh, methods here in the US. And we really try to, you know, hold that true through our packaging and everything that we do. We use a green cell foam packaging, which is uh, the most sustainable liner on the market. It's actually backyard compostable uh, and it's made out of a corn base that can actually be uh, dissolved in directly into the sink. Many of you have these boxes with the liners um, uh, at your house right now. And so you just cut open the, uh, the green liner. The green part is uh, directly recyclable and the liner, the insulation in the middle, you could even put in right in your sink and it'll go down no problem. Um, we have a lot of different options uh, for delivery um, and we're always bringing in special promotions for the holidays or Mother's Day, Father's Day. But really we want people to be able to afford our meat and to eat it on an every day or every weekly basis. Uh, Cause this is really the meat that I put my, I myself put in my body because uh, it is healthier and it is better for you. So our meat, we really try to make it uh, very competitive in pricing. And we really try to focus on our, our subscription plans. So uh, people can get their box every two weeks, four weeks or eight weeks. And we're pretty flexible about it. 
And we have three boxes, uh, the smallest being the Compo. The, our most popular size boxes are Asado. And then our largest for people that really like to cook for other people, have people over, uh, is the uh, Gaucho box. We also have some trial boxes available uh, for people that want to, you know, we understand that not everybody knows about Argentinian beef. And it, although it may be intriguing, you still don't know a lot, a lot about us or about um, Argentinian beef. So we wanted to put that option out there for a one-time purchase uh, for you to try it and uh, and hopefully get a subscription, which we have been finding a lot of success in. Um, I'm sorry, excuse me. Uh, and now if you guys have any questions, uh, I would love to open it up to questions. I'm sure, uh, you know, there's plenty to, to go on. Hi, everybody. This is Jane Colucci. I just wanted to welcome you all and wanted to ask if anybody had any questions now. If there's no questions, then why don't we go right ahead and um, we can throw it to Augustine, Chef Augustine. Hello. How are you all? Thank you for joining us. We are here in my kitchen. Um, thank you for the introduction, Jane and Michael. I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you guys got that first introduction to Carne Collective. I am the brand ambassador for Carne Collective. I am an Argentine-inspired chef. Uh, I was born here in the U.S. in Santa Barbara, California, uh, raised in Argentina, and always moved back and forth between both places. Um, so I really got to enjoy and, uh, and experience Argentina and the US and that's why I feel so comfortable working with Carne Collective as as I am a big uh, meat eater and, and most of my cooking for my private dinners and events uh, are all done uh, with beef. Um, I specialize in fire dinners so uh, we travel the world uh, with our Argentine made uh, custom grills and we we set up a really unique experience for every client um, around the world, cooking with fire and Argentine products. So here we are today. I have a, a recipe, which I'm sure you guys received and have in front of you. Um, I'm not sure if you guys will all be able to join me uh, doing the recipe, uh, but if you guys do have the ingredients and want to join me, feel free to do that. Um, here in front of me, I have, uh, all the ingredients to do the classic chimichurri sauce, which is a very traditional sauce um, in Argentina to go with any cut of beef. Uh, many people use it for other things as well because they really enjoy it, but mainly it's it's used for, for, red, for red meat. And that is because it's a mixture of fresh herbs. So we have parsley, we have oregano, we have rosemary, thyme, and sage. All of these ingredients are fresh. So nothing is dry. And then here in this bowl, as you can see, is uh, olive oil and red chili flakes. So this will be kind of the dressing uh, to our filet mignon um, milanese that I'll be cooking in a little bit also. So along with this chimichurri, I'm going to do in this pan here, I will be cooking the milanese, the filet mignon milanese. And then on this pan, on this flat top, I will be doing a hash brown to go along with this plate. So um, we're gonna go step by step. It shouldn't take more than 15 or 20 minutes. I'm gonna start by preparing the chimichurri and this is the parsley. So I'm just gonna chop it. It doesn't have to be very neat. I, you know, I like things rustic. I don't think that it needs to be all cut perfectly. Plus many people don't have the time to cut it perfectly. So, you know, just chop it however you can uh, and then we'll continue with the other herbs but for me it's the most important about the chimichurri many people in Argentina and around the world do it with dried herbs and uh, for me it's not the same the flavor is not the same the texture is not the same you know the dry herbs are, are um, a lot tougher than the fresh ones Okay, so here we go with the parsley, a little bit smaller. 
That should, that should be about fine. So we're going to go with the parsley into the olive oil. <clears throat> Once again, this is olive oil with chili flakes. So we're going to mix that up. You want to have a good amount of olive oil. You don't want it to be too thick. The whole idea of the chimichurri sauce <clears throat> is that you can sauce your steak, not only with the herbs, but also get that liquid of um, the olive oil in there, you know? So you want it to be nice and runny. Now we're gonna do a little bit of this rosemary. So we're gonna also, not too much. The rosemary, as you all may already know, it's very strong. So we're gonna use just a little bit of the rosemary. And we're also gonna chop it. This is kind of a basic recipe of my chimichurri. You know, everybody does it a little bit different. So I understand if there is some people that do not like one of the herbs that I'm doing, and that's not a problem. You can always change it and swap it out for another herb or just simply not use it. Um, so here's the rosemary. I'm gonna put a little bit of sage. The sage is also very strong. So just a few leaves. I have four leaves here for this amount. Um, the quantities, you know, there is kind of a baseline for the quantities of the ingredients. But what I what I always say is that, you know, uh, just do it your personal way. You know, it's a bunch of parsley as like the base. And then you can put, you know, a few tablespoons of the sage. If you like it more, you can put more oregano than rosemary if you like more oregano. So you, you can all personal, personalize the chimichurri the way you like it. Here is some oregano. I personally really love oregano, so I'm gonna put a little bit more than the other herbs. And it's also, it's also much, uh, it's not as strong as the other herbs, so you can really go ahead and put a little bit more. Like I said, it does not have to be finely chopped, super small. It can be kind of rustic. Okay, a little bit more. This will also go here. And lastly, a little bit of thyme, which I think is a really nice touch because it's very different than all the other herbs and um, it gives it a really nice touch, especially for this recipe today of the filet mignon Milanese using the uh, Carne Collective Filet Mignon, which is one of my favorites. Um, so here's this, a little bit of thyme. Chop it up. This one is a little bit easier because the leaf is already much smaller. Another thing, some people, when they when it comes to thyme, uh, they, they use a lemon thyme, which is also a nice, it gives it a nice touch. This is just the traditional thyme, but there is one with um, a touch of lemon. And that's really nice also to put on the chimichurri. Okay, so here's all of our herbs. Once again, this is parsley. This is oregano. This is sage, thyme. And uh, I'm going to add a little bit of this red wine vinegar here. Depending on how much you like red wine vinegar, I'm gonna put two tablespoons. Mix it up a little bit more. I'm also going to add a little bit of salt and a little bit of pepper. There's the salt. Quite a bit of pepper. I like it to be a little bit spicy. And also it has the chili flakes, which will give it a nice touch of spice. Also, that's something that if you don't like, you don't have to put. Okay, so here's the chimichurri, it's done. I'm gonna set it down next to the herbs. I'm gonna clean my board a little bit and I'm gonna bring over the filet mignon steaks. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna bread them. So to bread them, we use the eggs and we use the plain breadcrumbs. Okay, so. Excuse me, Chef Augustine, do you mind for a moment? We have a few questions. If we just um, ask the journalists for some questions. 
Yep. We're going to unmute everybody if you have some questions, if you want to start in. Patrice, I think you had one, and Rihanna. Hi, I think I heard somebody. Go ahead. Go ahead. Hi, how are you? What is your name? Right, the parsley, yes, the parsley is the main ingredient of the chimichurri. That's something that really cannot be replaced. But any of the other, uh, you know, you can take out the sage if you think it's too strong and you don't like it. Um, I've, I've heard of people making chimichurri with cilantro, for example. So it, it, you can really substitute all the, um, the three or four other herbs except the parsley. So the chimichurri, yes, that's a great question, actually. The chimichurri is supposed to have a few days. So, for example, when I make it for my for my dinners and for my events, we like to do it a few days in advance of the event so that the the flavors really absorb in and they uh, they get caught up in the olive oil. And also, remember, it has red wine vinegar, so that makes it really hold well for a couple of days for sure. So, definitely in the third or fourth day it's going to have much uh, a much better flavor. And I would say probably last about uh, two weeks. <clears throat> no problem. Anybody else have any questions? Go ahead. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Good question. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, that's a really loaded question. And uh, I mean, there's things that we can do here to make it better. We could, you know, really refrain from using feedlots. We could really move towards being pasture raised. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's going to come down to the consumer and, and potentially even the government to make changes that can actually affect because uh, a lot of the practices that we have here in the U.S. is to create cheap beef. Um, so we, you know, feed lot here, we keep them in poor conditions um, and it's it's all and we use poor genetics uh, all so that we, we can go get manager special beef at your local uh, grocery store. Um, you know, I think companies like uh, ourselves and there are more more companies and some more grass fed uh, companies here in the U.S. that are starting to pop up um, that are trying to do the right thing and be more of a sustainable uh, approach. Um, so I, I think the things that we can start on immediately are kind of moving more towards a, a pasture race that, because to be honest, it, it's much more humane. The animals get to be outside. They get to live their lives. Um, and, and I think that's, that's the number one thing that we can start with. Um, and then for the environment, moving away from feedlots. Um, I, I myself am from California. I don't know if you guys are very familiar with it, but every time I would drive from LA to San Francisco, you would always take the five up and there's uh, just farms along the side and you can smell the farms before you can see them. Um, and it's just, that's the kind of farming that we're used to here where we are just crowding these animals in such close proximity, feeding them corn and uh, trying to fatten them up right before. So uh, I think if we start to move away from, um, from feedlots and move towards more pasture raised uh, uh, product that we, and cattle that uh, we can get there. Uh, but it will be something that does take some time. And uh, I think also the big, best thing that we can do, uh, all of us, um, is to shop for better, more sustainable beef uh, because that will push better practices, which is what we're seeing now. We're seeing a lot more companies like ourselves start to pop up that are 
grass fed, you know, may not, they may not be Argentinian, but they're grass fed um, and they're trying to do pasture raising. It's because of consumer demand. I hope that uh, answers your question. Mm -hmm. Do we have any other questions or should we go back to Augustine and then answer some more questions at the end? If that works good, why don't we just go back to uh, Chef? Absolutely. Okay. So um, I have the eggs here. This is kind of the mix that we have to pass the beef uh, the beef through before we do it Milanese with the breadcrumbs. So I'm going to put black pepper in this to give it a little flavor and also some salt. This is about two eggs, two, two medium sized eggs. Uh, you know, maybe we would only use one, but I just put two just in case. Um, be safe. So now what we're going to do is we're basically going to pass. I'm going to turn on my pan here to about medium heat, medium to low heat. And here I have some, some melted butter. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass the beef, the beef on the eggs, and then I'm going to bread it here. My hands are clean. I'm going to bread it here. And once the two, uh, beefs are, are breaded, I'm going to cook them slowly on this pan with butter. So you don't want to cook it too fast because you want the beef to be able to cook in the inside without burning the, bed, the, the breadcrumb on the outside. So it's kind of a slow cooking at first. It's going to slowly cook from inside out and then it'll golden the breadcrumbs on the outside so that we create that, that, nice, that nice crust. So I'm going to go here. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bread, I'm gonna pass it on the egg so that the breadcrumbs stick. Okay, so here we go with the first one. I'm gonna do the second one here as well. Okay, this is gonna go to the breadcrumbs. And now we simply do the breadcrumbs on each side so that it sticks. You can do it with a fork, it's better because then your hands don't get all sticky. At first, at least for the first batch of, of breadcrumbs, it's nice to do it with a fork or something. And then you can start using your hands once it has a few breadcrumbs on it. Okay, so here it is. Now I'm gonna push it. You really wanna make sure that all of the breadcrumbs really stick onto the beef. This is what's gonna create that really nice crust on it. So make sure you get a good amount of breadcrumbs on each, on each one. This one is just about done on the sides as well. So flip it. Okay. Here it is. I can hear already my butter is nice and warm. So I'm gonna put it on like that. And if I need to, if it's too warm, I can lower the heat a little bit. But to start, I think it's gonna be nice. Okay, so here they are. And I'm gonna go straight to my pan and place them on there. Okay, so those are slowly cooking. I'm gonna wash my hands. And as those slowly cook, what I'm going to do is prepare here on the board the, um, the potato hash brown, which is gonna be kind of our garnish for this. Um, I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna cook it so it's nice and golden. And that'll be kind of the, the, the bottom of my plate. I'm gonna put it at the very bottom. And then on top, I'll place the Milanese and uh, top that with the chimichurri sauce that we made and a little bit of mustard uh, to go along with that. So I'm going to turn this on also to medium heat. This is a flat top. So this is really nice for, for, for doing something like a, like a hash brown or something because it's easy to flip. And it'll do a nice even crust. You don't want to use something that has too much of a lift or something. So that all of the ends of the hash brown have nice contact with the heat. So I have uh, a potato here and my 
cheese grater. I'm going to use the thicker side for this so that I have a nice, some nice slices of potato. And I previously washed the potato, but I'm leaving the skin on. And this is just raw. I haven't boiled it. I haven't done anything to it. This is just a raw potato, well washed and um, with the skin on. So there we are. I'm going to hide this in the, so you guys can see the potato. And just like that, what I'm going to do is once my flat top is hot, I'm just going to make little portions like about this size, just on my hand. You don't want it to be too thick. You don't want it to be too thin. And I'm just going to place it right there on my, on my flat top, just like that. Okay. So I make it on my hand first. And once I've kind of made it nice and flat, just put it right on my, on my flat top. I could actually, I'm not going to make it because I already put it on. I could have made a third one here, but that's okay. I'm going to wash my hands. My milanese are cooking. It's The butter is nice and warm. It's searing that bottom side. And it's cooking it, like I said, from the inside out. Because imagine that there's very small breadcrumbs all around it. So if you're cooking it on high heat and the butter is very, very warm, it's going to burn on the outside, the crust, and it won't cook in the middle. So uh, always medium to low heat at first with the... Uh, with the Milanese. Okay. Yep. You go ahead. Yes, so the traditional, that's a great question. The traditional Milanese in Argentina and in many places where you've had is usually thin. But in my opinion, this recipe is really nice because it's beef tenderloin. So it's it's kind of like a steak, but it's breaded. So you're gonna have a filet mignon, uh, you know, steak, but breaded. So this is a little bit different. It's not the traditional Milanese, um, you know, thinly sliced like it is in Argentina which is probably about half an inch thick. This is just basically having uh, a filet mignon steak breaded. So it's a little bit different. In my opinion, it tastes amazing because um, it's so it's so tender that uh, you know you can have you can have one nice portion and 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 uh, and feel great and not have to have maybe you know 15 of the other really thin ones. <laughs> It's about three, yeah, it's about three quarters of an inch. Um, and like I say, that that can really depend on each one. Uh, I wouldn't suggest making it too much thicker than this because the idea, like I said, is that you have the time to cook it uh, with the breadcrumbs and it doesn't burn. So if you go much thicker than this, it will kind of lose that, that, uh, that cooking process, which we're doing right now. You know, oh no, uh, I like to serve this uh, filet mignon milanese steak uh, about medium or medium rare. Uh, you know, it depends on everybody. I personally like it medium rare. So, um, but you can you can adjust that to to whatever you like most. Uh, personally, you know, in my experience, um, and especially like like Michael mentioned, you know, this grad fat beef from Argentina is really great to have it. Uh, medium rare, you know, it has excellent flavor and you don't want to overcook it. It's, it's, it's very lean, this cut, and it's, and it's great having it, you know, medium, medium, medium rare for sure. Yep. So here we're cooking the potatoes and as you guys can see, they're starting to golden on the outside. So what you're looking for here, you do not want to flip them until the potatoes have created a really nice crust on the bottom. And the way you can tell that crust is 
all of the outside of the potato will start to golden. So when it starts to golden, that means the very middle of it in the bottom is also golden. Um, you want to have a little bit of olive oil so that it doesn't stick. And um, you want to you want to go moving the temperature around because at first you don't want it to be too cold. You don't want it to be too hot. But once you see that it's getting that nice sizzle and that nice sear on it, you can uh, you can turn the heat down and, and cook it a little bit slower. My Milanese, I'm going to just bring it a little bit closer. I can already see that the sides are getting golden. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to flip it because I think that it's already created a crust on the bottom. So once it created a crust on the bottom, you can just flip it and cook it on the other side. And, um, and once it cooks on this other side and goldens, it'll be ready inside as well. So um, once again, this is the, the beef tenderloin milanese cooking in butter, just butter. This is our hash brown, which is our garnish for this dish. And we have our chimichurri sauce, which we made at the very beginning um, to sauce everything at the end. And we'll also put a spoon of uh, Dijon mustard on the plate as well to enjoy with this beautiful recipe. So I can see that it's starting to golden and it's not sticking. So I'm gonna flip it so that it cooks evenly because always there's a side of the pan that cooks a little bit more than the other. I'm not sure if you guys can tell in, in, in this camera angle, but you should be seeing all golden on the edges of the potato. That means it's just about ready to flip. It's, 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 it's golden, it's cooked. I'm gonna go ahead and flip this. Are you having problems with the, the uh, site? He's back. Okay, great. Okay, great. That's okay. Okay, so I flipped this first one, and I'm going to give it a few more minutes on this second one so that it goldens a little bit more. What I'm going to do now is add a little bit of salt and pepper. I don't like to add the salt and pepper prior to cooking it because I don't like it when you flip it and uh, the salt and pepper has really close contact with uh, the pan and it can sometimes burn the pepper and the salt a little bit. So I like to salt the potato at the very end. Once I flipped it, I'll put a little bit of salt and pepper on the top. My, uh, my beef milanese are just about done. I'm just putting it to very low heat while my potato finishes. And I'm gonna bring this plate, which is for the final recipe and the plating of it. Okay, I think this potato has brown is ready to flip. So this is a very traditional plate for Argentina. Um, you know, the Milanese is obviously a little bit, a little bit different uh differently done like you mentioned it's not as thin as we always have it in argentina but with quality beef like this taking advantage of being able to have a nice big steak is much better and breaded so it's double it's double the flavor um i'm gonna salt and pepper these potatoes here okay i think we're ready to plate so I'm gonna use this hash brown, which was cooking for longer. And I'm just gonna put it on the center of the plate like this. And uh, I am going to grab this one. There's my middle and eighth. I'm going to turn off the other one. And what I'm going to do now is get a little bit of Dijon mustard. I am going to put one spoonful on the plate here. 
I love mustard with the Milanese and, and all of this, so I'm gonna put it right there. And we will finish our lovely filet mignon from Carne Collective Milanese with the chimichurri that we just made. Remember to get a little bit of that olive oil, not just the herbs. And there it is. This is the filet mignon Milanese with a potato hash brown, homemade chimichurri sauce, and Dijon mustard. Excellent. Thank you so much, Chef Augustine. Does anybody have any questions again before uh, for, about the recipe or the cooking? We'll be following up with the recipe for all of you. I started the Milanese on medium because when it has that first contact with the butter, you want the butter to be warm. What happens if it's too cold? The breadcrumbs will kind of be floating around in the butter and uh, and it'll break apart. So you want that butter to be on medium heat, nice and sizzling, not too hot because it'll burn the butter, but you do want it warm. Once the Milanese goes on the butter and it is uh, and it is cooked and it's sealed, about a minute in, you can lower it to low heat so that the so that the Milanese can cook from the inside out and and it won't burn the breadcrumbs. So. Start at medium, and then throughout the rest of the cooking, low heat. Wonderful. Augustine, what kind of uh, pan are you using to cook the uh, filet mignon melanese there? So both of them, this is this is one that has a little bit of a side, so it's it's got depth. You know, you want to use a little bit of depth to cook the melanese with the butter. Um, but it, you can use any pan you know, if it's if it's cast iron, it's better. But if, if it's not, it's OK as well. Like I said, you are using quite a bit of butter, so you won't have problems with sticking. This is maybe a most important one to use a nonstick flat top, because mm -hmm. like I said, the potato hash brown has to have contact with the pan directly at all times. So if it's on a little bit of a slope, that'll, that'll make it more difficult. Amazing. Excellent. You're going to have to let us know how it tastes. <laughs> I know. I, I was going to say, can you I cut into it for us so we can all see? To, to have you guys taste it. Ah. Chef, do you mind cutting into it so we can see what it looks like inside? Yes, for sure. Let me get the... Uh... Oh, that looks great. Oops, sorry. And does anybody have any other questions either for the chef or for Michael about Carne Collective? Absolutely. Yes, that is. Uh, we actually source uh, my, so my best friend and partner, uh, Fernando Cantini, uh, is, who's based in Argentina. A lot of these farms uh, belong to his family. Um, so I actually went out there to kind of look and to survey them before ever jumping into this business, of course. And these farms are like nothing you've ever seen before. They're really, it was like being on a safari. They're just thousands upon thousands of acres. I think one of them was about a hundred thousand acre farm. And the cattle are basically just free to roam other than when we rotationally graze them to different sections of the farm. Um, but uh, yeah, they pasture raise their entire lives. Mm -hmm. Well, it's also a good question. I mean, you're going to see different things with different cuts. Um, if you have like a fattier cut, 
uh, like our ribeye, you're probably going to notice the biggest difference. Not only in the taste, it's going to be a little bit more robust, a little beefier, but you're going to feel a difference in how you feel the next morning. Um, so for me, where I was primarily eating a lot of USDA prime beef before this, which is really just a grating on the intramuscular fat within the beef, um, you kind of feel a little hunker down or slow uh, after eating something like that heavy. Um, so you're going to feel a big difference in the ribeye. Um, but as far as flavor, I think you're really going to see a big difference in, in our fillets. Uh, our fillets really have, because the, the, the fillet is a, a leaner cut. Um, and being inherently leaner, it's going to rely on either your seasonings or it's going to rely on uh, the quality of the meat. So you're really in the tenderloins of some of the um, more lean cuts. You're going to see a, a big uh, change in flavor. And then... Uh, you know, this doesn't really exactly have to do with it being Argentinian, but our ground beef is actually ground chuck. So normally ground beef from is just, you know, different parts, uh, whatever is left over to to create this ground beef. And for us, we just use a really noble cut in the chuck um, and we use whole primals of the chuck to uh, to make our ground chuck. So you're going to feel that I mean, you're going to taste the texture is going to be much better. You're not going to really have those pieces where you go to a burger place and you want to spit something out. Um, a piece that's hard to chew. You won't have that here. And the flavor will be uh, much better than a traditional ground beef. Absolutely. Do, do we have any other uh, questions? I, I don't think so. Well, I guess then I'll, I'll say thank you to everybody. I mean, this was actually a lot of fun for me. I hope it was as fun for you guys. Um, you know, this is our first uh, webinar, so I hope it went well. Um, and we're really, really proud to be announcing our partnership with Augustine Malman. He's bringing a lot of expertise and experience to the business um, and really bringing a, a lot of really interesting recipes that we can add a little bit more um, content uh, for the company. So uh, we're really excited. And if you guys have any questions at all, uh, I'm sure Jim will send you guys a follow up. You guys can reach out to us. We'll be more than happy to answer any questions that you guys may have. And thank you, Augustine, again for doing what, such a wonderful job. I wish I was there. Michael, it's a pleasure to be part of the of the of the Carnegie Collective family. As I mentioned before to everybody, uh, I travel the world doing Argentine-inspired events. So for me, it's it's a privilege to be able to travel and 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 serve this quality beef from Argentina. Thank you, Augustine. Well, everybody, thank you again. We hope to hear from you soon. And again, if you need anything. You can always reach out to us. Take care.